Greetings, everyone. My name is Amy Banks, and I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar, An Overview of the Guide for Developing High-Quality Emergency Operations Plans for Houses of Worship. This webinar is hosted by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students in collaboration with the Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools, or REMS, Technical Assistance, or TA, Center. Subject matter expertise is being provided by our federal partners at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Federal Emergency Management Agency. Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues from the REMS TA Center. Thank you, Amy. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Our call today is set so that only our presenters can address the group. However, we invite you to submit your questions at any time during the webinar using the Q&A chat function on the bottom right side of your screen. Our presenters will respond to questions during the QA session at the end of the training in the order that they are received and as time permits. Let's get started. The facilitator, Reverend David L. Myers, is the Senior Advisor to FEMA Administrator Fugate and the Director of the Department of Homeland Security Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships at the Federal Emergency Management Agency. David? Well, thank you so much, and good day, friends. It's so good to have you join us for this call today. We appreciate it very much. I want to extend a special thanks to the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students and the Education Department's Technical Assistance Center for setting up this webinar. It's my privilege right now to introduce to you Melissa Rogers for some brief opening remarks. Melissa serves as the Special Assistant to the President and Executive Director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Melissa formerly served as Director of the Center for Religion and Public Affairs at Wake Forest University Divinity School, as a Senior Fellow in the Governance Studies Program at Brookings, as the Executive Director of the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, and as General Counsel of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. Melissa, it's great to have you here. We seem to be having some technical difficulties. I know that Melissa is on, uh, but uh, in, uh, if, if she joins us, that would be great. Let me just say that uh, for Melissa, uh, and on behalf of the President, we want to express our appreciation for those faith leaders who took time out of their busy schedules to join the call today. We are especially grateful for your leadership and your interest in this topic and in the idea of keeping your communities safe from hazards of all kinds. When the President released his plan to protect our children and communities by reducing gun violence, he said, we won't be able to stop every violent act but if there is even one thing that we can do to prevent any of these events, we have a deep obligation, all of us, to try. So your interest in implementing this guide speaks to the President's sentiments. Now, hey, David, can you yeah, hear me? We can now, yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. We have somehow been on the line but, but uh, been unable to be heard. So uh, I, is, is it okay to just say a quick word? Please do. Okay, thank you. Hey, thanks everyone, and I'm really sorry about the technical difficulties that we've had, but uh, I'm so pleased to be with you on this call. Uh, and uh, like David, I want to just uh, thank you on behalf of President Obama for the work that you do every day to keep your community safe. We're really grateful for that work, and it's a privilege and an honor to think about being able to work with you in future days on ways that we can improve the safety and the prevention aspects of all our communities. Um, we know that this guide is, is technical, but we look forward today to beginning a conversation with you about uh, how we can best improve uh, various features of our houses of worship 
as we try to be as safe as we can. Um, so we look forward to today being the starting point of a conversation, and we look forward to getting feedback from you about how your own community is uh, working on these issues and ways that we can assist you as you go about your work. I want to say a special word of thanks to David Myers and to Jana Scott and the rest of the staff at the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships at DHS. They do tremendous work across a range of issues, including these very important issues. So with that, let me just thank again everyone who has joined the call and thank the people who will be leading us through uh, this work this afternoon and welcome again feedback from you all about how we can do our work better. David? Oh, thanks so much, Melissa. It's great to have you on. And we do appreciate so much the President's leadership on this important issue, and we appreciate your support as well. Now, let's turn to John Cohen for some brief opening remarks. John Cohen serves as Principal Deputy Counterterrorism Advisor at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and is Senior Advisor to the DHS Secretary Janet Napolitano. He provides leadership to the Secretary's Homeland Security Advisory Committee, among other bodies, leads the development and implementation of department-wide counterterrorism operational activities and programs, including those associated with detection and prevention of, response to, and recovery from acts of terrorism in the United States. John has an extensive background in Homeland Security, cybersecurity, law enforcement operations, and policy development. He was Senior Homeland Security Policy Advisor to the Governors of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the State of Arizona, and in 2004, John was selected by National Journal as one of the 100 key people in Homeland Security. Join me in welcoming John. Uh, thanks, David. Can you hear me okay? We're good. Great, thanks, and thanks, Melissa, for joining the call. Um, I think it's pretty amazing, and it speaks to the importance of this work, that there's over 650 uh, participants on this webinar from 375 cities in 32 states. Um, and I think it's uh, equally important that uh, as we are here today to discuss uh, the recently released um, Emergency Operations Guide, um, that uh, it's, it's important to note uh, that this guide was uh, only made possible because of the strong partnership and the efforts of, uh, on the federal government side, FEMA, Department of Education, the FBI, uh, and DHS, but we also work closely with our state and local law enforcement, fire, EMS partners, but I would say most importantly, um, we worked uh, with faith leaders from around the country. Um, as some of you may know, and you will hear from some of these folks today, uh, Secretary Napolitano uh, established a faith-based advisory committee as a part of our Homeland Security Advisory Council. We have a faith, it includes faith leaders from around the country, uh, and this group um, has, um, has really evolved and uh, has been part of a, a very strong uh, partnership between the department, uh, the FBI, uh, and um, uh, these communities uh, across the country. Were it not for the input provided by these faith leaders, uh, the guide you're getting briefed on today would not be possible. But with the release of this guide and if the holding of this webinar, this is not the end of our efforts. Um, but it is, the, uh, it is the, just the completion of one phase. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, and we look forward to working with all of you and carrying it out, whether it is expanding our ability to work with your constituencies around the country on site-specific security, uh, site security assessments and planning, whether it's expanding upon our information sharing capabilities, particularly during critical incidents, so we can do a better job getting information to you that you can then share with uh, the people who work in houses of worship or religious-based schools or in community facilities run by your organizations. Uh, we want to continue to expand on our efforts to conduct uh, training and, um, and training-related exercises. Uh, because planning is one thing, but if you don't train and, and exercise to that plan, um, then the plan is only as good as the paper it's written on. So these are some of the priorities in the coming months 
that we at the department, uh, working with our federal partners, our state and local government partners, as well as uh, all of you, uh, that we plan to uh, look to carrying out in the, in the months ahead. So uh, I'll leave it there and let you get into the substance of this. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar, uh, and uh, I look forward to continuing our, continuing our collaboration. Well, thank you, so, thank you so much, John. Your presence on the webinar means a great deal, and it's a great way to get things started. Friends, as we thought about promoting the guide, we decided, along with Jeff Appman, who you'll be hearing from shortly, to start by presenting the guide in, I guess, what you could call its purest form, so that those who want to immediately go forward in developing a plan can do so. But we've added three dimensions to our approach, which we believe will help increase the usability of the guide as we move forward. First of all, we want to hear from faith leaders, and we're going to be doing that even on today's call. There's going to be a rhythm here where we'll have government officials presenting, and we'll hear a response back from those faith leaders. These leaders are members of the Secretary's Homeland Security Advisory Council that John mentioned. And they're going to be introduced soon by Mike Myron, the director of the council. Second dimension is we're going to have follow-up dialogue opportunities. We will take as many questions as we can on the webinar today, but we know that we won't get to be able to get to them all. So we've decided to keep the lines of communication open in a couple of ways. First of all, through our address at the DHS Center. And I'm going to give that to you now so you have pen in hand. It's info fbci at dhs.gov, and that is info fbci at dhs.gov. The second way is through a new FEMA Community of Practice Discussion Board that we'll be talking about later on. We want to further promote uh, dialogue after this webinar and learn actually from one another about how best to make the guide useful for any house of worship, regardless, regardless of its size or the resources that you have, uh, any house of worship that wants to develop an emergency plan. And finally, a third dimension is an on-the-ground technical assistance initiative that we're going to be launching uh, sometime uh, a little bit later uh, in a couple months uh, during September, perhaps. Uh, so over the next two to three months, the DHS Center, in partnership with Jeff Alfman's team, will unveil a plan for on-the-ground technical assistance this year-long effort will take place in five to seven cities nationwide. You're going to be hearing more on that uh, as time moves on. We hope that you will allow us to join with you as you do the important work of ensuring that our houses of worship are safe places for people looking for help. You can start submitting your questions now if you haven't already. And just as soon as you're ready, as soon as what you hear, please do go ahead and submit those questions. We want to incorporate as many as possible along the way, and then a few at the end. Let me introduce now our US, some U.S. government representatives who will be participating in today's webinar. Uh, first is uh, Jeff Affman, who is the Director of Office of Counterterrorism and Security Prepared Preparedness, FEMA Protection and National Preparedness. Uh, Don Lumpkins, or Doc Lumpkins, is the Director of National Integration Center, FEMA Protection and National Preparedness. Uh, Andrea Schultz is the Chief of Commercial Facilities Section, DHS Office of Infrastructure, uh, Infrastructure Protection. Uh, and we're going to have a special presentation on the new community of practice at FEMA by Marcus Coleman, who is a program specialist at FEMA Individual Community Preparedness Division. And now I'd like to introduce to you Mike Myron, who is the director of the Homeland Security Advisory Council. And Mike is going to make a few brief remarks and introduce our faith leaders who will present in a responsive kind of way uh, to the, uh, the government officials' presentations. Mike? Uh, thank you so much, David. Um, I just want to give a quick overview on the Homeland Security Advisory Council. It provides advice and recommendations to Secretary Napolitano on matters related to Homeland Security. And the council is comprised of leaders from state and local government, first responder, community, the private sector, and academia. Uh, the council is chaired by Judge William Webster and vice chaired uh, by Chief Bill Bratton. Um, in early 2012, Secretary Napolitano tasked the HSAC uh, to uh, look at uh, issues regarding the faith community 
Um, and as a result, we formed a faith-based security and communication subcommittee under, under the HSAC to provide findings and recommendations how DHS can improve upon its relationship with faith-based organizations and how better to share two-way security information and better protect uh, their infrastructure. As John Cohen mentioned, uh, the Council issued its final report in uh, May of 2012 to the Secretary um, that contained findings and recommendations uh, that uh, were, were the foundation, one of the foundational documents uh, um, on the guide that we're, we're speaking uh, about today. Um, the initial report the HSAC put forward can be found on, its, on our website at www.dhs.gov slash HSAC. Um, I am pleased to introduce four members of the Faith-Based Advisory uh, uh, Committee um, that will be speaking today. Uh, the first is Paul Goldenberg, um, who is with the uh, Secure Community Network. Uh, the second is Katie Oldiger of uh, Catholic Charities. Um, we have Swam Mariardi of the Muslim Public Affairs Council and Jajit Singh of the Sikh American Legal Defense and Education Fund. These speakers, along, uh, along with others, have provided invaluable work to the Secretary and the Department and were instrumental in developing the work uh, on the guide that uh, we're briefing today. So I'm, I'm very pleased to have these members uh, available uh, to speak to uh, this audience. David, I turn it back to you, sir. Oh, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it very much. Uh, friends, let me just introduce a, a couple of other uh, government uh, people who will be available during the question and answer period. Amy Banks is a management and program analyst at the Center for School Preparedness, Office of Safe and Healthy Students, U.S. Department of Education. Uh, Reverend Ken Bedell is a senior advisor at the U.S. Department of Education Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And Catherine Schweit is the supervisory special agent, U.S. Department of Justice, FBI Criminal Cyber Response and Services. I'm now going to turn this over to Jeff. I've introduced Jeff. He's a, a close team member in all of this. Jeff, take it away. Okay. Hey, good afternoon, and thank you, Reverend Myers, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm pleased and appreciate the opportunity to join this webinar today uh, and talk to you about the guides for developing emergency operation plans for houses of worship. As you know, this past January, President Obama outlined his plan to reduce gun violence. He called on the Departments of Education, Justice, Homeland Security, and Hu Health and Human Services to work together to provide the best possible preparedness guidance to communities on how to plan for and recover from the many emergency situations they may encounter. This is really a huge accomplishment. Think about it, five federal organizations agreeing on something and publishing it. Okay, so as a result of this effort, last month, President, Vice President Biden publicly announced the rollout of the three preparedness guides for schools, K through 12, institutions of higher education, and houses of worship. As many, of, as many of you may know, the United States has 250 houses of worship that provide a safe worship environment as well as an environment for many community activities. Some provide needed daycare services for our hardworking parents, and many serve as education facilities for our children at preschool, middle school, and high school levels. Houses of worship serve as cornerstones in our community and gather places for many number of events and often utilized at times of disaster, crisis, and as places of sanctuary and refuge. As you will soon see, developing emergency operation plans requires close collaboration and support with local government and community partners, so leaders can plan for emergencies to create executable emergency operation plans and serve as a foundation in assisting congressional teams in developing new and revising existing plans. The guide is broken into four main sections. The first is principles of emergency planning, which I will get into more detail later. The next section is process. The planning process discussed in this guide reflects its flexibility and how it can be easily adapted to accommodate a house of worship's unique characteristics in different situations. Effective emergency operational planning cannot be done in isolation or in a vacuum. This guide points out that it's critical for houses of worship to work with their local emergency management agency first responders and community partners during the planning process as an effective EOP is integrated with the community, regional, and state plans. Strong collaboration will provide and make more resources available and most importantly ensure seamless integration of all responders and community partners. 
After process, we get into developing the basic plan. This section provides an overview of the House of Worship approach to operations before, during, and after an incident. It addresses the overarching activities undertaken regardless of the function, threat, or hazard. The content in this section provides a solid foundation for the Houses of Worship emergency operations planning effort. And our final section is the Closer Look, which considers key topics in planning considerations in the event of an active shooter incident, such as preparing for and preventing an incident. This section also goes into great detail on possible responses to an incident and what can be done before, during, and after to prevent and mitigate and recover from an incident. Now let me take a few minutes and talk about Presidential Policy Directive 8, commonly referred to as PPD-8. PPD-8 was signed by the President in March of 2011 and describes the nation's approach to preparedness. This, direct, this directive represents a dynamic shift and evolution in our collective understanding of national preparedness. Based on the lessons learned from criminal activities, natural disasters, and terrorist events, the document defines preparedness around five mission areas. They are prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. So let's start with prevention. The purpose of this guide, for the purpose of this guide, prevention outlines the capabilities necessary to avoid, deter, or stop an imminent criminal activity, natural disaster, threat of a mass casualty incident. Prevention is the action houses of worship can take to prevent a threat or actual incident from occurring. The next missionary is protection. Protection is the capabilities to secure houses of worship against acts of violence, whether they are man-made or natural disasters. Protection focuses on ongoing actions such as protecting people, networks, and property from a threat or a hazard. The third, the third missionary is mitigation. Mitigation outlines the capabilities necessary to eliminate or reduce the loss of life and property damage by lessening the impact of an incident. In this guide, mitigation also happens, also means reducing the likelihood that threats and hazards will happen. Collectively, prevention, protection, and mitigation activities generally occur before an incident. Keep in mind, these three mission areas do have ongoing activities that can occur throughout the incident. Response is the next mission area, which focuses on the capabilities necessary to stabilize an incident once it has already happened or is certain to happen in an unpreventable way. Things like establishing a safe and secure environment, saving lives and property, and facilitating the transition to recovery, which is our next mission area. Recovery are the capabilities necessary to assist houses of worship affected by an incident in restoring it to a safe and stable environment so services and activities can resume. Before I move on, let me point out that emergency management officials and emergency responders in your communities are familiar with the terminology in this guide, and these missionaries generally align with the three frames, three time frames associated with an incident before, during, and after. Okay, so that brings us to the first section of the guide, principles of planning. As I mentioned earlier, it's critical that planning should be supported by leadership, and leadership should initiate and support planning efforts to ensure engagement from the congregation and outreach to the entire community. Using assessments, planning needs are customized to the building level and should consider all hazards, all settings, and all times. Planning should provide for access and functional needs of the whole worship community. community. The community includes regular attendees, guests, and staff, including those with disabilities and others with access and functional needs. Some of those are racially and from racially and ethnic diverse backgrounds and people with limited English proficiency. It's also important to remember that threats and hazards can affect you at non-standard times as well as in off-site venues, such as an activity or an event sponsored somewhere other than the grounds of the House of the Worship. So let me emphasize here that creating and revising model emergency operation plans is done by following a collaborative process which this guide provides. It also provides a solid format for a plan and the guidance on content that allows flexibility to be used by your planning team. Let me also encourage you to continuously 
evaluate your plan for, useful, for usefulness and adapt it to ensure its tools do not undermine the collaborative process. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to turn it back over to Reverend Myers. Jeff, thank you so much. Great information. And as I mentioned at the start, we have brought on uh, our faith leaders to be a part of the conversation. And so it's uh, my pleasure here to bring in Paul Goldenberg uh, to respond to Jeff's presentation. Paul? Uh, yeah, Reverend Myers, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Paul Goldenberg, and I've been asked to participate in uh, this very important program in my capacity as the national director of the Secure Community Network, which is the official National Homeland Security Initiative of the Jewish Federations of North America and the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations. What I'd like to say is, is that um, through, through information sharing, security awareness, uh, training and education, our goal, and our goal working uh, as closely as we have been with DHS and FEMA and, and our other friends at, uh, uh, throughout the, uh, the faith-based community, has been really to empower individuals and, and those of us that are responsible for houses of worship and organizations to establish what we refer to as a culture of security consciousness, preparedness, and resiliency for our communities. Um, I also have the privilege uh, and honor currently is serving as uh, the co-vice chair of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Faith-Based Security and Communications Advisory Committee, uh, where we have been working uh, for several years uh, with, uh, with the agency uh, to help develop uh, uh, similar types of uh, uh, products. I sincerely commend the department and FEMA for not only recognizing the vulnerability of worship, but also the valued partnership that our, organiza or our organizations bring to the Homeland Security mission. We all collectively share in this country, and more specifically, developing this important planning guide, which is the subject of today's call. We really have uh, uh, very unique challenges. Um, as open, welcoming institutions with scarce resources, many of our resources go to to, uh, to feeding uh, the poor and to, uh, and to uh, other activities, educational activities uh, throughout the, uh, the various um, houses of worship, uh, the mission um, has been other than security. So with scarce resources for security and emergency management, um, I, I truly have seen and personally seen a tremendous disparity in the security posture and emergency management planning capabilities and or lack thereof amongst our uh, houses of worship. And, and it's not by any fault uh, of our own. Um, nevertheless, it really is imperative that a reasonable baseline security standard and common set of practices and procedures for dealing with crisis or emergencies be adopted and implemented so that our, our collective houses of worship are better protected here in this country to deal with incidents that may impact our very, very important critical missions. And, and truly the paradigm has changed. And unfortunately we have seen um, houses of worship here in this country uh, uh, become uh, uh, victims of, of various types of attack. Um, our approach should seek to establish what we've termed, again, a culture of security, which means focusing on situational awareness, preparedness, uh, public-private partnerships, planning, training and exercises. And the document that you're hearing about today really is, is an exceptional and, and an exemplary uh, uh, beginning and start. Because where we always begin is, do you have a plan? And this is laying out the foundation for that plan. Equipping our constituency with the knowledge and confidence to know what to do, how to react, empowers them quickly and effectively to respond to an unanticipated emergency. And, and as we see in the past 24 months alone, um, our houses of worship have been impacted from everything from weather uh, to, uh, to accidents uh, to, uh, to man-made uh, and uh, uh, other uh, acts that have uh, impacted each and, one, each and every one of our institutions. So in doing so, we're really preserving the very purposes of our houses of worship to continue to remain open and welcoming 
but at the same time safer and more secure because that's, that's what people expect today. So through efforts such as today's event, we, we really do create a transferable model to promote community awareness, link our community to, uh, to government agencies such as DHS, FEMA, and others when planning for natural or man-made disasters. Expand, we, we need to expand existing public-private partnerships that really do mobilize our communities to increase homeland security and rapidly deploy the best practices, programs, and exercises for establishing a common set of standards and practices for all of our institutions. And uh, all of our institutions are, are, are common. It's where people come to, to worship, to pray, uh, and, and, and to, uh, and to uh, uh, socialize uh, with others in a safe setting. So my response really is, is, uh, you know, is a key discussion point uh, for the planning of, uh, of these types of incidences. I think what you heard from our expert is that we need to make sure that um, we consider when we are planning um, that we consider holidays, we consider special events, we consider the special missions of your institutions. And when thinking about the collaborative process, um, you know, you can have an institution with, with one person from the clergy uh, that represents the entire institution, or you can have an institution with hundreds of people. But it, it's extremely important to ensure that you include um, your facilities managers, your groundkeepers, your receptionists, your ushers. Um, these are the people, these are the eyes and the ears, the, 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 the term is force multipliers uh, that can help keep people alive and safe during a, an unfortunate uh, event. And then, of course, and last, um, when we do bring this important group of people together who are responsible for our missions at our houses of worship, um, that's when we, 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 we extend the hand out to our law enforcement first responders uh, and ensure that we sit at the table uh, during this very important process. Um, Reverend Myers, I, I think that's it for me at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. And it's so good to have the perspective of our partners uh, from the faith community. We're going to turn now to Doc Lumpkins. He's going to actually have two different installments, and there'll be a respondent in between. The first installment is on the planning process and then the plan. But uh, we'll go with the planning process now. Doc? Great. And thank you, Reverend Myers. And uh, thank all of you for uh, joining us today on the call. Um, as was mentioned first, I'm going to talk briefly about the planning process uh, and really turn it over to uh, one of my colleagues in the community to provide a little bit more uh, uh, real-world application. Um, so the planning process uh, that we lay out in these guides is really designed to be flexible, to be adaptable, to meet your needs. Uh, the whole guide is designed such that you could use pieces uh, develop a plan for a very small uh, house of worship uh, with a small population all the way up to a large uh, multi-building facility. Uh, in fact, you can use this planning process uh, to plan events, uh, prepare your sermon, uh, all these different things. I've used it to uh, plan birthday parties. So it really is designed to be flexible and adaptable, and I encourage you to uh, take it out for a spin in that regard. It's also important to remember that this is not done in isolation. Uh, the benefit of the process, um, a quote often ascribed to Dwight Eisenhower, is that the plan is nothing, the planning is everything. Uh, the greatest benefit of the planning process is working together, working with partners outside of your house of worship to understand how you'll work together when there is a moment of crisis, um, to understand what your expectations are and for them to share theirs. Uh, and that's not just uh, fire, police, CMS. That's uh, those is surrounding you in the community uh, and how you work with each other. And so understanding that this is uh, the foundation of the planning process is critical. The planning process, very basically, is six parts. Again, you can expand and contract as needed. Um, it is based on the planning process that is used day in and day out throughout the emergency management community. So 
So you'll find that as you go through this process and you talk to those, uh, your local emergency manager, your, your county emergency manager, county law enforcement, that they are undertaking the same steps and the same efforts. This doesn't exist in isolation, and that's one thing I want you to think about as well. As you conduct the planning, it has implications for the kind of supplies you might keep on hand. It has implications for um, how you educate uh, the members of your house of worship. And so keep those pieces in mind and involve your membership. Um, they are a powerful tool for executing this plan in a moment of crisis. Uh, the steps are ascribed there. We won't spend a lot of time on them, but to talk briefly on each one, uh, forming a collaborative planning team, as I mentioned, uh, don't do this just by yourself. Don't do it in isolation. Um, you will have volunteers uh, amongst your group who want to help with this. Um, understanding the situation, you face a variety of uh, risks on a day-to-day -day basis. What I think you will find is that by engaging uh, local officials in your community, that they have, uh, for the community-wide footprint, already assessed these risks. You know, the chances or, or potential impacts from a tornado, hurricane, um, what threat exists from violent actors. Uh, you don't have to start from scratch. That work is out there already. So to engage those uh, members in your community um, and work with them will save you time. Uh, identifying what's important to you, determining goals and objectives. Um, again, I think you know those. I think you know why you want the emergency plan in place, why you need it to be successful. And this, this is a chance to identify those um, and identify key points for your efforts. And we'll discuss that in more detail in a little bit. And then it really comes down to uh, identifying how you're going to do things like evacuate the building, uh, how you're going to do things like account for the membership, uh, and writing the plan, steps four and five. And then implementation, doing the training you need to do uh, on a routine basis, uh, taking advantage of uh, opportunities with different special events to really test out the plan. Um, but that theory, and what I'd like to do is hand back uh, to Reverend Myers uh, and Katie Oldecker to talk about practice. Uh, thanks so much, Doc. And that was a great quick overview of a, a planning process that uh, it's, it leads to a successful outcome. Uh, we're pleased to have Katie Oldecker with us. And Katie, I'm just going to let you jump in with your response. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, at Catholic Charities USA, our disaster response department is responsible for the preparation, uh, response recovery, and mitigation of all sorts of disasters uh, for the Catholic Church in the U.S. and the U.S. territories. So we do often uh, work with either our diocese or with parishes on preparedness activity. So what I want to do is kind of take each step and break them down a little bit because I know um, we often show the various process steps for um, to a parish or a diocese, they get a little overwhelmed. So they want to, uh, too many steps and too much to take on. So I'd like to just break it down a little bit and try to help you lessen that feeling. So step one is forming a team. Often seen as one of the hardest parts of the process is deciding who should be involved and who should lead the efforts. Just remember your pastor who has a lot going on or your church leader doesn't, often, doesn't really have to take the lead. There may be a parish council member or a parishioner who has emergency management experience. The key is don't be afraid of asking your congregation for assistance with this. They are your best resource. Um, the team should be made up of representatives from the various entities within your parish. Don't forget, as um, Paul said earlier, to include all the various entities. So your school leaders, if you have a parish school or the thrift store volunteers, give them all a chance to take part. Let your fire chief, your police chief, and city or county, county emergency manager know that you're beginning this process. They may not have the time to assist throughout the process, but they, there could be members of their departments in your parish already. It doesn't hurt to invite them to join you. Also remember, as the previous speaker said before, that this is a team of volunteers. Encourage them to take their time and be thorough with each step. They can meet once 
or twice a month for six months to a year. That is not an unreasonable time frame. So step two, um, definitely make an appointment with the city or county emergency management office. Have them bring information regarding the area emergency plans and the geographical hazards information for your parish. Use their expertise. You don't have to come up with each risk on your own. Um, for instance, is your church on a floodplain? Um, that is information that they can help provide to you. Uh, table 1 on page 7 of the guide is also a really useful tool. We use a version of that tool in every plan that we make. Uh, step 3, the goals and objectives. I really encourage you to divide this into two parts. The first being, what truly are the risks we may face? What is likely? If you're on top of a hill, far away from the river, then you might not necessarily be seeing a flood, but wind damage could be a real big hazard. But don't forget that you might think security issues, like an active shooter, aren't very likely, but they are more likely than you may think. So please don't leave them out of the planning. Um, part two would be, how can you mitigate against or reduce the impact of these risks? What are the steps you really need to take? So step four, plan development. Um, the guide talks about who, what, when, where, how, and why, and I think these are a great way to look at each part of the plan. The guide is wonderful for walking through these steps. I just caution you to avoid being too specific for each type of natural disaster you may face. You may want to start with generalizations. For instance, if you need the shelter in place, where do you go? And always keep that in mind for all sorts of hazards. If you can't have services because the building is unsafe or is it, it's unsafe to get to, is there a secondary location you can go to? So start with those general issues. But be sure to be very specific around security incidents. You really need to have details for how to deal with an active shooter, for example. Also, think of your uniqueness as a parish and make sure you include those unique pieces. For Catholics, we teach our parishes to have a plan for removing the Eucharist from the tabernacle if they need to evacuate the church for an extended period of time. That's something we saw often in Hurricane Katrina is we actually had to get priests back through, back, um, through the checkpoint so we could go back to the parishes, grab the, <laughs> grab the Eucharist out of the taber tabernacle and take it with them. Um, also, don't forget to look at your insurance coverage. We've had several parishes who found that they don't have adequate insurance coverage to co uh, cover these types of incidents. And then step five and six really go together for me. There is great detail in the guide to help you. Just remember that the plan should be accessible. If you have church services in multiple languages, get someone to translate the plan into those languages. Train everyone involved with running the parish, your pastor, your ushers, your volunteers. Train at least on a yearly basis and review the plan. But don't be afraid to change it. It should be a living document that can be tweaked as need be. And really the bottom line, it's a long process, but you can make the plan unique to your own parish's needs. Just please don't be afraid to start. Thanks, Mike. Or thanks, David. Uh, thanks, Katie. And thanks for breaking that down. That was excellent. Uh, we got some uh, usable chunks there. We're going to go back to Doc now, who's going to talk about the plan itself. Doc? Great. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Katie. Um, really thought that was a nice way to show how this really works. Um, so now I will talk about the elements of the plan. Um, I will apologize ahead of time. This is a very dense section of the briefing, um, and my voice is not the most melodious, uh, so I'll ask you to bear with me as we uh, go through these parts. Uh, so there are a number of potential components to the emergency operations plan. And at the end of the day, it really is up to your house of worship um, to assess, based on your requirements, what of these components do you need? And we'll break that down a little bit. First and foremost is the basic plan. The basic plan really is all the stuff that you need, regardless of the threat or hazard, regardless of the actions you're trying to take. It also serves as a stopgap for the things that you never thought of. So when in doubt, you can fall back to your basic plan in order to take care of the members uh, of your house of worship and to be able to save lives, save property, that sort of thing. So. There are some basic elements here that I'll breathe through a little bit to get to the real uh, meaty stuff. Um, material.
Welcome to Verizon Wireless. The wireless customer you called is not available at this time. Please try your call again later. Announcement 1, switch 1, 7, 0, dash 3. I will stand by one second because this is clearly transmitted. Okay. Welcome to Verizon Wireless. The wireless customer you called is... Is... <laughs> the line is just... No, there we go. Uh, so... Uh, we will keep going, and Melly, I assume you can hear me, judging by uh, what you're typing on the screen. Uh, so we will continue. Um, the introductory material covers the basics. Uh, who has approved it? Uh, that it's been signed off on, uh, and the contents of the document itself. Uh, the next section lays out the purpose of the document, sets the foundation for uh, what is contained in, basically a brief synopsis, uh, and then the situation overview is a general discussion of the threats and hazards. This again is not meant to be an exhaustive treatise, um, but rather what are uh, the things that you're most worried about, why this is necessary for your house of worship. Also in the basic plan, is a discussion, what's called the concept of operations. In other words, uh, the broadest terms of what your intent is. Uh, so for example, your intent is to ensure the you know, safety of the members of your house of worship, uh, to ensure the protection of key uh, religious uh, artifacts, relics, what is the term of art is appropriate for you. Um, and any other things that you might want to lay out in terms of those uh, key priorities. Organization and assignment of responsibilities, uh, what the expectations are for the staff of the House of Worship, uh, families, guardians. You know, this is something you're going to want to be able to share with your members. And so it helps for them to understand right off the bat, what are the expectations for them? They have to be an integral part of this. what's called direction, control, and coordination. So in other words, um, you know, in the event of an emergency, who is going to be providing the instructions? Who is going to be handling, if there's a child care facility, who is going to go to that facility to ensure that they've received instructions, they're taking action as appropriate? Um, again, the very basics, stuff that if you have a plan already, I, expect, I suspect that you probably have outlined somewhere in your existing documents. The very fancy title of information collection, analysis, and dissemination. Uh, basically, it is how you're going to find out what you need to know. So for example, is there a weather radio? If there is, is there somebody who is in the vicinity of it? that will hear it and be able to warn of an oncoming tornado or a change in weather? Is there a way that you're collecting information from the news? Are there linkages with local law enforcement so that if there's a potential threat against your facility that you are getting that information? Basically, this is where you discuss when it comes to the information you need, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Training and exercises. Um, you are not expected to be running uh, a test, which is what an exercise is, of your plan you know, every day, every week, et cetera. You know your membership. You know what your needs are. Um, but as much as you might run a fire drill uh, on occasion for your facility, uh, you may want to consider other types of drills, and we'll talk about some of the functions you might think about. Finally, admin finance and logistics. Uh, this is the kind of thing uh, where it might refer to other policies that you might have, again, depending on the size of your house of worship. And it really is important to note that all of these things are designed to be incredibly flexible. So if you have a very, um, you know, I, the example I will give you growing up is that I went to a, 
a Baptist church that was literally referred to as the church in the woods. Um, congregation 25, combined age of the two staff members, I'd say probably 250, 300 years old. And they, they didn't have the resources to do a big plan, so they developed what's needed and work with us uh, to ensure the care for people in the Sunday school program, for the choir and choir practice, all those things. Last element of the basic plan, uh, get into a little section that says, you know, we're going to review this every year, um, you know, or every two years, that development and maintenance cycle. And then if there are any formal agreements you might have with other houses of worship in your area, with local schools, uh, to receive evacuees, things like that, you're going to want to list those here in that section of the plan. That's the basic plan. That's your day in and day out. If anything happens, you can go to that and you'll have a degree of understanding about how you're going to execute, how you're going to take care of people, who you've made engagement with. Now, the next level of this, beyond the basic plan, are what are called functional annexes. In lay terms, these are the things that you do that cover a number of threats and hazards. Think evacuation, think shelter, um, different types of functions that you might execute for one or more threats and hazards. And remember when earlier I talked about goals, objectives, the courses of action in the plan development phase, this is where they start to come together. One thing that is important to remember as we talk about functions, many may occur simultaneously. So for example, once you evacuate uh, your facility, you may want to then account for everybody. You know, are all the children with all the guardians, parents? Um, you're going to still be evacuating people, but you want to make sure you're collecting and accounting for everybody at the same time. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of functional annexes. There's obviously much more content in the guide, um, but they will give you a sense of uh, what some of your options are. So the three that we've got asked about the most, especially given that some of the discussion as you can imagine, in developing this guidance dealt with the notion of an active shooter, are the concepts of evacuation, shelter in place, and lockdown. Uh, these all have different elements and different requirements. So, you know, again, basic terms, evacuation is what we're doing in a house of worship to get people out of the building. We want them to go to a parking lot. We want them to go to um, a school across the street, uh, uh, Hardee's down the road, wherever we want them to go, but we want to declare that ahead of time so we know where to look for everybody. Lockdown, on the other hand, is keeping everybody in and locking or controlling access into the building, into the space where your uh, members are located, controlling access to a child care facility, what have you, because you're attempting to deal with an immediate threat of violence. Obviously a very different action from evacuation. Somewhat similar to lockdown is shelter in place. The difference, of course, is that you're not dealing with a violent threat. You're rather, rather dealing with what we would call a natural or technological hazard. Uh, in lay terms, a hazardous material spill. Uh, something has happened to cause a problem at a nearby dam. Things like that. Uh, so where it is not in the interest of safety for people to go outside, we call that shelter in place. Uh, another annex you may consider is your recovery annex. So I will tell you uh, my wife uh, worked in the Red Cross and disaster services, and one of the things that she occasionally had to deal with when we had a fire in Baltimore, where I live, is that occasionally that happened at a house of worship. And a good thing to have in your recovery plan is that if you lost facility for whatever reason, where would you conduct services? Where would you conduct Sunday services? Where would you conduct your Shabbat services? What have you? 
Do you have a place already identified, a community center or something? That's part of that recovery. Security annex, fairly self-explanatory, uh, dealing with the things that you might do on a routine basis to ensure the security of your facility and to ensure that persons who do not belong there do not gain access, in particular, in consideration for your child care facilities if you have those. Um, last uh, few slides for me. Um, functional annexes are not always enough. So you may want hazard-specific or threat-specific plans. And that's where you're taking a number of different functional activities that you've outlined and explain how they come together. Um, so for example, you know, the one I gave you earlier, uh, you might have a fire in the building, so you want to talk about fire and how you're going to evacuate and account for everyone. With the threat of an active shooter, you might talk about how you lock down first and then get everyone out of harm's way. So there are a number of different hazards to consider in that regard. Um, there's a couple lists here, natural hazards. Uh, many of you already have a plan dealing with things like fire, and that's one thing to consider here. Technological hazards that deal with hazardous materials incidents, power failure, um, uh, fire caused by more routine events than a lightning strike perhaps, um, and different things that you might face uh, from a technological standpoint. And then of course, uh, what we refer to as adversarial uh, or human caused threats, those threats and hazards that are driven by, uh, to be blunt, a bad guy. Um, and require different thinking and security issues to be uh, cognizant of those requirements. Um, that's the basics of all the plan elements. Again, you expand and contract as needed. With that, I'm going to hand over uh, to Reverend Myers uh, to talk about the next piece here. Thanks, Doc, and thanks for going through that very dense information uh, in such a clear way. Uh, we're glad to have Salam Mariotti with us to respond. Uh, Reverend Myers and um, everyone for having us on this call. This is the month of Ramadan, and uh, this plan is really important, uh, especially for us in the American Muslim community, since practically every night uh, our houses of worship uh, worship are full uh, with uh, with people praying uh, through midnight. And so, um, I know that you know this document is very technical, but I think we can put it in religious terms and uh, have, uh, have an appreciation for this document. And I think this is where faith-based communities can help in partnering with our government in uh, translating or interpreting uh, such uh, important yet technical documents to our communities and, and the role of our communities in, in being these, uh, uh, these multipliers that, uh, that Paul was talking about. Um, you know, in, both in the Quran and in the, uh, uh, in the Torah and Old Testament, uh, there is a reference that uh, God is is uh, making uh, very clear to us that you know for the one who kills a human being it's as if he's killed a whole human civilization and for the one who saves a human being it's as if he's saved um, a human civilization and this is this means that it is our responsibility as community leaders uh, responsibility to God and responsibility to our communities that our sanctuaries remain exactly that, places of safety. And I think this is the language that needs to go out to our communities, that the preparation and the planning process in preventing um, violence of, from uh, affecting our houses of worship needs careful uh, planning and, and preparation. Uh, just last week, by the way, there was an active shooter that went through a mosque in New Jersey um, during the Ramadan services at, at night. So. This is not something that is um, that uh, infrequent, unfortunately, uh, or um, rare. Uh, I think every every uh, uh, group should be prepared for that. Um, the uh, other issue that uh, I think is important is that each community has certain cultural practices that government needs to be aware of. Uh, however, in cases uh, of emergency, I, I know in my religion, for example, 
if uh, you know pork is is forbidden, but in cases of necessity, in cases of emergency, when there's no food around, God basically says, if you're driven by necessity, you can you can um, uh, suspend the law, the religious law, and take care of yourself. So, the most important thing for religious law is to save lives, uh, to keep our houses of worship safe places, to keep our houses of worship as uh, safe places for conversations, uh, and the number one goal, again, as I mentioned earlier, is um, to preserve life uh, in our communities. Uh, so even if there are issues of segregation, for example, between men and women, I think those rules are suspended in these particular situations, and I think it's important to have conversations to our communities about these cultural practices and, and certain rules that are suspended in cases of emergency so that when we deal with first responders, we deal with them in a very effective way. Now, some people may ask, you know, do we need to get involved in these programs in order to be qualified for working with the federal government or federal funding? And the answer is no. You don't need to be a part of this planning process. However, the more involved you are, I think, the, the better equipped you are in working with the federal government and maybe even be more qualified for federal funding. Um, and as was stated before, uh, this is not necessarily going to be um, uh, needing the clergy to be directly involved. Uh, I think laypersons, security coordinators, or managers can be uh, identified in each house of worship uh, and communities. For some communities, I know, like for the American Muslim communities, it's probably easier uh, to work in regional councils, council of mosques, uh, as opposed to working uh, with each and every mosque. Uh, because uh, of the lack of organization and uh, organizational development in our community. So looking at it regionally may help in terms of applying this plan in, a, in, a, in, a, in an effective manner. Again, the key word is preparation. Um, and this is not just a government term. It is also, um, again, as I said earlier, it's a matter of leadership in our religious community. Because for the first few critical moments after a crisis, whether it's a man-made uh, disaster or a natural disaster. Um, the first few critical moments before first responders arrive can save a life. And, and if we save one life, uh, again, it's as if we have saved uh, one human civilization. And it's not just uh, a responsibility towards God that we have. Uh, we also know that God is pleased with us when we serve our community in this manner. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Salam. Uh, great insights, and again, from a religious leader perspective, it's such a necessary part of the conversation. We're going to go now to Andrea Schultz. He, she's going to take us into a deeper dive on the plan around the active shooter. Andrea? Thank you very much, and uh, I'm really happy to be here today to talk about this subject because it's a subject people don't like to talk about, but I believe very firmly that the more you talk about things that make you uncomfortable, the more prepared you'll be in dealing with those uh, terrible, horrible things. Um, think for a moment about how your house of worship, if there was an emergency to occur, how long is it before law enforcement arrives on the scene? Uh, do they get there in two minutes, five minutes, seven minutes? In some cases, if you're a rural environment, it may be longer than 10 minutes. So think about that when you develop your plans, because that's how long you're going to be on your own. And that's how long you might have to be uh, working to protect the people that are there that day. Uh, I think that I want to reflect back on Doc Lumpkins talking about it's not just having a plan, but the process of planning that is so important, and training that plan, and drilling with the people that are in your building and exercising. Part of the one of the most key things is creating a team of the right people to develop that plan to ensure that all the factors are being considered. I've heard a couple of the speakers already mention groundskeepers. I think Paul uh, talked about that earlier. But you have people that work in the building. You also have people that visit in the building. You have regular volunteers. And I think it's also important to consider what expertise you have within your community. Because this is a place where people come to worship. And you may have people who work in hospitals, who are teachers, who are great community, um, community leaders already. You may have people who are good communicators. You may have people who work in law enforcement or, or medical EMS that are members of your congregation, members of your community. And I think that part of building this team may be to also tap into some of their expertise and not just rely on the people who are employees there. 
Also on the slide here, it says that you want to share your information with first responders. I would say that you have to go further than that, and you have to bring them into part of your planning process. Some folks talked about some of the considerations uh, about cultural needs that different communities may have. Well, it's likely that the first responders might not be aware of that. They may not be sensitive to different cultural environments. And so by making them part of your planning team, you can actually help educate them, and they can talk to you about how their response to an emergency like an active shooter is going to be. And everyone plans together and is a little bit more prepared. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we always train in a workplace environment scenario. I talk about that all the time. This is different. We already know that. You should train all your employees to your plan, but also train your community to the plan as well. Something you might try to do is once you have a plan written, is say, hey, on Tuesday nights for the next month, we're going to be doing an emergency planning night and have people that are members of the congregation come and take place in those discussions. Um, you're facing challenges. It's unlikely that you're going to be able to train the entire congregation. And also think about people that are there for the first time, visiting family and friends, coming to worship for the first time. They might not be familiar with the building. You can train your congregation officials, employees, and volunteers that are there regularly, but it's also important to train people that, hey, you're going to be looked to um, you're going to be looked to as a leader in the case of, of an emergency. I, I'm reading through questions on the right-hand side as people talk, and some people talk about name tags or identifying some kind of identifying um, uniform marker or something like that for the people that work there. Well, that's not a bad idea, but there are other more creative ways. Maybe you give a boutonniere or a corsage to somebody who's an official or a pin that somebody wears on their lapel, something to identify someone as a leader within the organization so that visitors know who they can follow. And those leaders should have kind of marching orders that they understand what they need to do in case of an emergency. We also want to talk about warning signs. And I, I want to point back to the document that we're here reviewing today. As you go through this document, which you can download from the website, I want you to pay attention really closely to the footnotes, because in these footnotes are some really incredible additional resources. This document wasn't just thrown together um, in a dark room here in Washington, D.C. A lot of people pulled a lot of resources together. One of the resources I want to um, reflect on was put together by the FBI in 2002, and it talks about workplace violence issues. Um, but there are a lot of lessons learned from that document that can be applied in different environments. So part of this education process, and I think that in the House of Worship, this is part of what you do culturally anyway, is help people that are in crisis. So some of the signs that are pointed out in this document apply here too. So if you have somebody who is um, all of a sudden obsessed with weapons or very hypersensitive to criticism or have some kind of fascination with violent movies or weapons, maybe this is somebody in crisis. And what a perfect environment to try and help get these people some help. But these might be red flags about someone within your own community that might need some extra attention. So look at those extra resources in the document that we're talking about today. You can go to the next slide, please. So in specific response to an active shooter situation, again, everything we're talking about today is planning. So as you've coordinated with your law enforcement and other first responders, talk through potential issues of evacuation or sheltering. We're going to get into that in a little bit, um, a little bit more. But if you have a multi-story building, Maybe evacuation might be a challenge. As law enforcement and first responders are trying to come into the building, are people evacuating going to be a challenge for them to respond? Uh, training empowers people to take action. I talked about this a little bit already, that when you talk about these scary things that could happen, whether it's a hurricane, an active shooter, or some other kind of bad thing, when you talk about it, some people believe that we shouldn't talk about it because that's just going to scare people. It creates fear. But actually talking about these things, training can help people to be more confident in making decisions during an emergency. There are a lot of additional considerations. We already talked about a little bit about the cultural needs or maybe grabbing specific items that have to come out or things that need to be protected beyond life and human safety. But also remember that you may have special needs people in your in your community there that need help getting out of the building. How are you going to help those folks? 
So make sure you plan for that as well. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. We talk a lot about run, hike, fight. Um, you've heard that in the media a lot, but it's just an over simple way. You know, we all remember growing up with stop, drop, and roll. So run, hike, fight is a very simple way to think of how we can get ourselves to safety. But to elaborate on this, we want to really think about in terms of evacuation. Is this the safest thing for you to do? It might not be. Leaving where you are may actually put you into harm's way. So this is part of planning. When you're doing your planning, walk through your building. If I'm here and there's something happening over there, is leaving my best option. If it's not your best option, you might want to hide. If it is your best option, then commit to that action. Make sure when you evacuate, you're keeping your hands visible and follow any law enforcement instruction if you encounter any first responders. If evacuation is not the best, then hide. Or we've heard some people say lock down. The bottom line is talk to people about the difference between cover and concealment. Cover is going to protect you. Concealment is just going to hide you. So hiding behind something with a curtain or a thin wall may protect you from the view of an adversary, but it might not protect you from a bullet. So always um, try to improve your hiding position um, if you can. Stay secure until law enforcement tells you it's time to come out. So we all saw the Sandy Hook shooting, but that same week there was an incident that occurred at a shopping mall out west in Portland, Oregon. And that facility had a great plan in place. They had trained all the people that work in that building. And when they cleared that building, when law enforcement cleared the building, hours after the shooting, they actually came upon some mall employees and customers that were still hiding in a back room hours later. And the police asked the young woman, why are you still here? And uh, her answer was, well, the plan says to stay here until law enforcement says it's safe to go. So I think that's a great example of stay in place. When you are hiding, remember simple things like turning off your cell phone or turning it on silent so that you don't give away your hiding place. Make sure when you call 911, you wait until you're in a safe spot, then call 911. But keep an open line so that 911 can hear the ambient noise and that those people can try and relay more information to the first responders. And go ahead and change the slide. Fight. Is, this is really the last option. If evacuate and shelter were not options for you, you are facing the guy who wants to shoot you. Um, take some action. Really try to save your own life. Don't just be a victim. Throw, yell, throw a book, throw a chair, throw a shoe, yell, do what you can to try to over, overtake the uh, adversary there. It, it's something that some people don't feel comfortable with, but talk about it beforehand. Uh, me personally, I'd rather go out fighting. So this is something that you want to just empower people to do. If you're looking for more resources specific to active shooter training, there is a website, dhs.gov slash active shooter, you can visit that website and there are all kinds of resources that will help you specific with this threat. Um, for the next slide, interacting with first responders. I just really want to say this is important to train people in your um, community as well. When the police arrive on scene, their first responsibility is to reduce or eliminate that threat. So they are going after the person with the gun who is shooting. And it's important to have that conversation with folks because it's very hard for law enforcement, it's very hard for people to see law enforcement war walk past a potentially injured person in order to get to the shooter. But that's what they're there to do. That's how they save more lives. Um, it's so important to make sure you follow instructions. It's so important that you prepare people for potential screaming or pushing or things like that because law enforcement has a mission to do. Keep your hands visible. Sometimes in chaos, a cell phone in a hand could look like a weapon. So drop everything. You can come back later for your phone or your keys or your purse. Those things really aren't important right now. Uh, and make sure and talk to people about this when you're conducting drills or you're doing any kind of training. I think another topic, we talk, I talked about this already, is you know, poll your congregation. Maybe there's some law enforcement within your own community there and sponsor a preparedness night or a preparedness discussion. And you can have people from all different perspectives talk about this. There may be people in your own uh, congregation that have some experience with this, but they can talk about it with each other. So I think that might be a good idea. 
Um, and then the last slide of my discussion here is going to be planning for the aftermath. So after an active shooter incident, there's really two phases. There's immediately after when you're going to be trying to do some um, reunification of victims with their families and loved ones. And uh, how are you going to work with first responders to get injured people out of there? Make sure that you are setting up some kind of call line or hotline for people to find information about people that might have been there during the incident. And then more long term, uh, House of Worship is a place where people go for support in a time of crisis and after they're healing from crisis in their lives. Well, your whole community, your whole congregation may have just gone through a crisis and are going to need to lean on each other. So within your own network of communities, of houses of worship, it's important to reach out to each other. There have been acts of violence that have occurred in house of worship, and how do you heal, and how do you mend, and how do you get back to um, being in the business of supporting each other and, um, and, and through your faith. So I think these are some important things to plan. A lot of times when people are doing planning, they're thinking of through an incident or through a crisis, and not necessarily through after the crisis. So make sure that you're including this as part of your planning as well. That's all I have. Thanks, Andrea. Appreciate yep. so much uh, the, the deeper dive there, very specific. And uh, we're privileged to have with us uh, Jajit Singh. And we've uh, asked Jajit to give his perspective on a closer look uh, that uh, Andrea just presented on the active shooter. Jaji? Uh Thank you, Reverend Myers. Can you hear me? You can, yes. Great. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Um, you know, for the Sikh American community, these scenarios are really uh, all too real. Uh, with the shooting of six members of our community uh, last August in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, we were left wondering if there was something we needed to do differently. And uh, of course, our community has faced many challenges, especially post 9-11, but nothing to this, this magnitude. So I would say that acknowledging that this is you know, within the realm of possibility for your community is perhaps the first step in addressing it. Um, as many have mentioned, we think of our religious institutions as our safest places, so, so it makes that sort of violence all the more inconceivable. Um, now, although these incidents happen so fast, um, you know, there's still uh, much to be gained from preparing for such a scenario, and, and you can take that from, from me as someone who spent uh, 10 days uh, after the, the shooting in Oak Creek um, last year and, and learning about the, um, the, the trauma, obviously, afterwards, but the confusion uh, during uh, the actual shooting. So looking at this uh, closer look section of the of the guide, a few areas really stood out to me as particularly interesting and relevant um, given, you know, the active uh, shooting scenario that, that uh, occurred in Oak Creek uh, last year. Uh, in particular, I'd like to call out uh, the, the section preparing for an active shooter and uh, as well as responding to an active shooter. In preparing for an active shooter, uh, there's a, a part that discusses how to evacuate or lockdown personnel and visitors, and also how notifications will occur. Um, basically, the idea that we would use familiar terms, sounds, lights, electronic communications, uh, to basically alert everyone that an active shooter is on the premises and there is uh, uh, imminent danger around. Um, that's something that stood out largely because when the uh, incident happened in Oak Creek, there was, in fact, confusion about what was happening. Uh, people didn't know that an active shooter was, was around. In fact, not only did they not know that there was one shooter, there was a thought that there was maybe multiple shooters. There was confusion whether it, there was some sort of electrical issue which was causing it. And that may, uh, you know, it's hard to say, but that may have resulted in uh, a lot more um, uh, damage or fatalities than, than could have been if we had a plan in place. Um, the other section I'd like to call out was responding to an active shooter where, where it's discussed that, um, that you respond immediately when a shooter is known to be active in the facility, um, whether that means rot, run, hide, uh, or fight as a last resort, which was just discussed. Um, it's important that action be taken right away. And I can tell you from our experience in dealing with the community there in Oak Creek, 
Um, as I said, there was confusion about what had happened. Uh, one of the things that we learned right away was um, uh, kids were the first to notice that something, to hear sounds, but they alerted grown-ups that there were firecrackers going off. And so this idea that, you know, there isn't a shooter, there's just, uh, you know, something else, as I mentioned, electrical issues or, or firecrackers, those um, impede an individual and a community's ability to protect themselves. So I thought that that section in particular was, was uh, very well thought out. Um, so I'll say just in closing that, um, uh, you know, we never think that something like this could happen to one of our communities. Uh, but I'll tell you from the other side that when it does happen, uh, you want nothing more than to go back in time and wish that you had taken the necessary steps to prepare. Uh, we're taking our lessons learned uh, post a tragedy, and I hope um, that we all as a group can leverage each other to continue to move forward and, and prevent actually something like this in the future. Thanks. Jaji, thank you so much. And uh, from the front lines, your learned experiences uh, contributes so much to what we understand in planning for the future. We're going to go to a question and answer period time now. I'm going to introduce Marcus Coleman, who's going to facilitate that. And then uh, at, toward the end of that, Marcus will talk a little bit about the FEMA community of practice. Marcus? All righty. Thank you all very much for joining the webinar today. We received a lot of questions regarding access to the PowerPoint, access to the recording of the document, or access to the recording of this webinar, and access to the document, which we'll get into in a bit later. Um, the PowerPoint will be available um, in a few days after this webinar as well as a recording and we will be sure to send that link out through our communication channel. So if you'll be patient with us, we greatly appreciate it. Um, I'd like to send it over to Jeff Askman first to talk about how people can access the actual planning guide. Thanks, Marcus. It's, it's really quite simple. Uh, if you go to the FEMA.gov slash plan uh, and in the search function you type in ELP, how, houses of worship, or emergency operation plan, it will take you to the appropriate uh, document. Alrighty, thank you very much. And for the next question, we had a few people that asked where they can get people to help them complete the plan if they're doing a comprehensive plan for the first time. And I'll send it over to Doc Bluffkids to get started. Sure, thank you, Marcus. So a couple of quick points on that. Uh, to get information, again, about planning itself uh, or the guidance, as Jeff mentioned, fema.gov slash plan, and you'll see information on there along with a link to the technical assistance program. What I would suggest, however, first and foremost, is that you work with the emergency management officials in your community uh, as you develop the plan. Uh, they have not only the expertise in planning, but they have the familiarity with the community in which you operate, which is an important asset, and work with them to develop your plan. Uh, however, through the FEMA.gov site, FEMA.gov slash plan, you can find information on technical assistance, and we can also direct you uh, to what is called the Lessons Learned Information System, LLIS, uh, where we have sample uh, plan templates and things like that that will help as well. We'll also work with our partners uh, to make some of this information available through other means. All right, thank you very much, Doc. Um, Follow-up question, there are houses of worship that may not allow phones in the house of worship during particular services or particular mm -hmm. times of the day. How should they go about planning for in the event of a, uh, in the event of a disaster or a hazard, making sure that if their facility is larger than just a particular room, that they're able to communicate across the house of worship? Sure. The, um, that is a really um, challenging question, obviously, on a number of fronts, dealing with religious practices and simply how you may conduct services. Um, the answer to that really is a decision that each individual house of worship must make. Um, I would suggest that in some cases you have already made that decision uh, in that I suspect that you already have a plan in case there's a fire and how you might get that information uh, or learn of that information if it's occurring in a remote part of your facility. 
I would not change or move away from that um, to deal with different threats and hazards. Use those same mechanisms. But if you do not, um, then you know, while the decision remains yours, um, I would ask you, I would suggest that you will have to take a hard look as to whether there is someone, um, a staff member, a member of the congregation, whomever, whose job it is uh, to you know, be just outside the service with a phone, to have access to a weather radio, and things like that, so that in an event of an emergency, uh, you have uh, the information you need to make an informed decision. So uh, the one follow-up on my earlier response regarding planning guidance, templates, and information, um, as we talked about run, hide, fight in this uh, webinar today, um, if you're not familiar with those terms, uh, if you are not familiar with how run, hide, fight might work in your house of worship, there is a link uh, in the guidance uh, to materials that were developed by the city of Houston as part of a grant program, the Regional Catastrophic uh, Preparedness Grant Program with the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA that readily explains for you uh, not only what run, hide, fight entails, uh, but also uh, uh, how that executes. Uh, I believe, and I will defer uh, to any of my colleagues, uh, that the Department of Homeland Security also provides information on active shooter incidents available through the site. That, that's correct. And, and uh, uh, Andrea, do you want to uh, you want to talk to that a little bit? Well, there. Hi, this. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. There's, a, there's also a video developed by the Department of Homeland Security Office of Infrastructure Protection on that website I mentioned earlier, dhs.gov slash active shooter, as well as links to online training, planning tools, back of the house posters, things that can be hung out of the main area of view, wallet size training cards that talk about the concepts of evacuate, hide, and fight back as well as what to say when you call 911, the types of information that you might want to provide for a 911 operator. They're all on that dhs.gov slash active shooter website. All right, thank you very much. We understand that there are a lot of questions and we want to make sure that you're able to continue the discussion. One way that you could continue that discussion is on FEMA's new National Preparedness Community Faith-Based Community of Practice web portal which I will briefly cover um, with the last few minutes that we have here. On the web portal, you can actually, we have a discussion board, we have resources, there are templates for potential plans, um, and we want you to really take some of the questions that you've asked of us today and take it to this web portal. There are three, there's three simple steps to join. First is going to www.community.fema.gov. From there, you want on the home page, click on the Community of Practice box. They may ask you to join to become a National Preparedness Community member if you aren't one already. After becoming a member, click on the Community of Practice box and select which community you'd like to view or join. There is a specific faith-based community of practice that we strongly encourage you to join. Any conversations, any